kind introduction and thank you everyone for having me here. Everyone out at Del Bar and everyone who was uh, kind enough to come and, and listen to, to what I had to say about uh, my story and about the Wounded Warrior Project, something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I guess the, the story starts on, on Long Island, as uh, many across the world do. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I grew up a uh, normal middle class lifestyle, I guess, uh, on Long Island. Uh, played a lot of sports growing up, kind of tried everything. Um, and while in high school, I, I wrestled and I played lacrosse, uh, of which I was, I was decent at both, but lacrosse was, was my main interest. So, you know, around my sophomore, junior year, I started to look at colleges, and I kind of wanted to do something a little bit different. So uh, one, of, one of the lacrosse coaches came down from Army, from West Point, uh, and started talking about the school. One of my friends was interested in it. And I said, you know what, this, this is what I want to do. This is something interesting to me, something different, something kind of out of the box, uh, and something unique. Um, so I kind of put all my eggs in one basket, hope, hoping on it. And, um, and I got a call probably, I, I imagine it was, I think it was the winter of my senior year, saying, you know what, John, I'm sorry if that we, 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 we didn't get you. We couldn't get you. We were one of the uh, one of the assistant coaches from Army. Uh, unbeknownst to him, I got a letter a week before saying that I was I was admitted to the prep school. I said, "What are you talking about, coach? I was just I just got into the prep school." He said, "Oh, oh, oh I just disregard what I'm saying." It's kind of one of those one of those uh, <clears throat> weird weird moments. So, so anyway, I found out I got into the prep school and went on to the prep school. This was something that I really wanted to do. And plus, prep school gave me kind of another year to work, work on my skills. So I went off to uh, the prep school in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, which is now closed. Uh, so now I'm at West Point. So I went down to Fort, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Uh, and prep school was half regular Army guys and half guys from high school. So I went there, got an extra year of lacrosse, worked on my left hand. I used to stay after practice every day and, and shoot hundreds of balls. Me and one of my buddies, we would just sit and shoot, sit and shoot, sit and shoot, sit and shoot, and just work on the things that I knew that I needed to get better at, at as a player. So I finished prep school, went to West Point, uh, you know, trying out for the team. I ended up making the team. I'm pretty sure I was probably the last guy who didn't get cut. I was a decent player, but I just... I, I knew I had to work hard. So for my first two years at the academy, um, obviously the other aspects of the academy were pretty tough, the, the academics aspect of it. Um, and I wasn't really playing lacrosse all that much. And it was, was kind of discouraging as, as a player uh, because I was working hard every day. And it's one of those things that you experience in sports. Um, you know, there, there are gifted athletes out there that from the moment they, their, their feet hit the field, they, they could just do amazing things. Well, I wasn't one of those players. I was a guy that I really had to work on. So there were times when it was tough, but I said, you know what? I'm just going to keep pushing myself. I'm just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and eventually my time will come. So uh, my junior year, when the starting attack man got hurt, kind of stunk for him, but it was good for me, because <laughs> I, I had my chance. I now had my chance to play. So that year, I, I ended up doing pretty well, and I became the third leading scorer on the team. Um, and coming from a guy that didn't play and never really stepped on the field, I was pretty psyched about it. Uh, so even more importantly, out of that year, um, my junior year was the fact that all my teammates voted me in as captain of the team, which was, uh, which was a pretty humbling, humbling experience. And, Thing to happen to me uh, because I went from a guy that didn't play to a guy that is now the captain of the team. Uh, so, you know, kind of in life, as you go through life, uh, there are times for retrospect, and hindsight's always 20 20. So, in looking back, you see the things in your life that kind of stick out, and that happens to be one of them. Because if, any, if at any point during those first two or three years, I said, you know what, this really stinks. I'm not getting the playing time that, that I deserve. Coach isn't playing me. Um, there are a million things that you could say. Academics is really tough. I should really, you know, just concentrate on that. Or, or any excuse that we try and give ourselves to kind of give up. I, I didn't do that. 
I didn't do, and, 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 I, and I kept pushing myself. And, and the opportunity came. Is that opportunity always going to come? I don't know, maybe not. But if you're not trying, you'll never know. Because if, if I had given up at any time prior to that, I would have never got the opportunity. So it's kind of something that I've always kept in the back of my mind. Now, through the rest of the academy, graduated uh, in the class of 2001, in June of 2001. Now, we all know what happened in 2001. I was sitting in a classroom in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which, by the way, is much different from Long Island, New York. <laughs> uh, and they ushered us out in Ohio, and, and I watched the World Trade Center come. Now, going to a military academy in a relative time of peace, this was kind of one of those aha moments. So, holy cow, I went to a place, and I've trained for four or five years, and now I'm going to go to war. It was like looking down the barrel of a gun. So, went through, did about two more years training, became a platoon leader, found out I was deploying to Iraq. The trade center coming down seemed to mean a little bit more, more to me. Maybe because I was from, from New York. And, you know, I'd gone there on trips as a kid with my family. So it obviously, it obviously hit home. So when, when I found out that I was going to deploy to Iraq, you know, you try and get yourself psyched up for it as you would, as you would for a game. At that point, I had been dating my girlfriend for, uh, for a couple of years, and we decided to get married before I deployed. So I deployed to Kuwait on January, January 20th of 2003. So I went off to Kuwait and participated in the, in the ensuing invasion of Iraq in March of 2003. It was a crazy time. Uh, kind of one of those times where being an athlete helped out. Because being an athlete in any situation teaches you a lot of things. How to work as a team, how to overcome adversity, uh, how to kind of play through the play, pain, how to <clears throat> take, a, take a, a situation and adapt. Take a situation where maybe you're down a man, maybe you have to do things differently, and that's one of those things that kind of sports, and lacrosse especially, teaches you how to do. So in Iraq, it was, it was the perfect proving ground to, to, kind of, to kind of put into practice all those principles that, that I learned through my athletic career. So <clears throat> every day was something different. We're, we're, not, we're not getting much sleep, and we had to learn how to do things differently because what we were seeing was not how we trained. And we had to learn, and we had to adapt, and we had to overcome. Uh, and, and, every instance, and in every instance, we did that. So we're about 20 miles south of Baghdad, and we were firing rockets on Baghdad International Airport. It was the day before we took Baghdad International Airport. I hadn't slept in two days, and we pulled into an area, and we conducted security of the area to make sure that there were no enemy in the area. And I had set up on the flank, on the side of one of, of my platoon, and on the flank of them, and they were firing rockets. So I took the first security shift. <clears throat> An hour later, my gunner went up and took his shift, and I finally got some well-deserved rest. And then an hour later, he switched with, with my driver. I woke up, and I, and I heard a loud sound, and it was one of my launchers shooting. So I realized what it was. I hadn't gotten much sleep, rolled back over, and went down to bed. I woke up about a minute later on the ground. <clears throat> and my legs were numb and different parts of the ground were on fire. My ears were ringing. I was like, what the heck just happened? <clears throat> I pulled off my sleeping bag and I looked at my feet. And I realized at that point that my life had changed forever. But it's one of those things that training does. I just kind of sprung into action and I crawled over to my vehicle and I grabbed my rifle and I grabbed my Kevlar helmet and I put it on and I looked inside the vehicle. You know, my vehicle was loaded up with like 12 cases of 50 caliber ammunition, hand grenades, rocket launchers, everything you can imagine in there. And I look under the vehicle to a sound and I hear just the fuel spewing out of the bottom of the vehicle. 
So I said, fuel, fire, ammunition, this is not a good situation to be in. So I start to crawl away from my vehicle, and my gunner calls over, calls over to me. He says, LT, LT. So I crawl over to him. He was not in good shape, but I put my rifle on his chest and attempted to drag him away from the vehicle. And finally, two guys came over. I said, take him and get him out of here. And I just kept crawling away from the vehicle. And then two more guys came over and got me. About 30 seconds later to a minute later, the vehicle exploded. Started cutting off all the ammunition. So we were kind of lucky that, that we got out of there. So we went through a battery, uh, through, through a series of triage points. And all triage is, just like if you go into a hospital, triage is where they assess your injuries and they treat you for them. So basically with me, they were just wrapping my feet up and trying to stop whatever bleeding they could. And I went from a battery man at that point to a battalion man at that point, where basically they were just calling in a chopper and waiting to get me out of there. So finally the chopper came in and got loaded up. And I woke up in a field hospital, which I cut up along the, our rack on the way up. I woke up in the, in the field hospital in Iraq, and, and I had asked about my gunner who was on the flight. And uh, he ended up passing away on the flight, on the medevac flight that, that we were on. This was the guy that I dragged away from the vehicle. So after uh, a few times of a few field hospitals along the way, I finally woke up in, in Kuwait. At that point, I realized that the three men that were next to me had all died in the incident. And from that point forward, I said that I would never feel sorry for myself. Yeah, it kind of really stunk that I'd gotten hurt really bad. But the mothers, the sons and daughters, the wives, thought I was the lucky one. So why would I think about it any differently? Because I certainly was. I was still alive. So went through uh, Kuwait, went through Spain, and then finally hit Walter Reed Army Medical Center and saw my wife. And I was lucky to have her by my, in my side. While at Walter Reed, I received my amputations. And I lost my right leg below the knee and my left foot. And that started the process. That started the rehabilitation process, which I described as kind of a crawl, walk, run process. Literally start out crawling on the ground to, to get to the bathroom. And then get your prosthetics and standing on them for 10 seconds, and then 15, and then 30, and then a minute. And then being able to take a step with crutches. Uh, and then sitting down. Keep it doing it, keep it doing it, keep it doing it. And every day, I was able to do more and more and more. And it was just kind of one of those things that being an athlete helped out with, hey, you know what, I'm just going to keep pushing myself. I'm just going to keep pushing myself, and it's going to get better, and it's going to get better. And it did. It kept getting better. My biggest enemy at that point was time, that I wanted to have it quicker. But you can't really fight time. You just do what you can and work the hardest that you can in the moment. So, went through the rehabilitation process, and by the end of that summer, I was hurt April 3rd of 2003. I see my life probably about a month and a half later and put them on and, and stood up at the 2003 West Point graduation in, in June and started walking that summer. And we had the big wedding that we weren't able to have that October. And then I was riding by the following spring and playing the crosshair. So that's what I wanted to do. It was my goal to be able to do all the things that I was able to do before, and I've kind of accomplished that goal. I helped, I fish, I play lacrosse, I climb mountains, I've gone rock climbing, skiing, hiking, biking. You, you name it, I've, I've probably done it since I've been injured. And one of the organizations that kind of helped me out along the way with that was the Warrior Project. It, it was an organization that had just started, so I kind of had the opportunity to see it grow. And it, and, it was, and it was really, really, really a great thing. One of the things I realized, and this was kind of another one of those things that I'm talking about in retrospect, and it was kind of looking back at my life and all the decisions that I made, and realizing that no matter what, we always have a choice. And it seems simple to say. It seems simple to say, yeah, no, no kidding, you always have a choice. 
But it's also easy to argue. Well, no, you don't always have a choice. You know, you can get hit by a car. <coughs> this could happen to you. That could happen to you. Yeah, that's all true. You can't always choose what happens to you. But you always have a choice. You always have a choice in how you deal with it. When I was hurt, I had a choice. Do I go on with living or do I go on with dying? I chose to go on with living. There's only one way to do that, and that's just keep going forward. Now, right from the beginning, Moon Warrior Project, I was there. I got to see the organization grow. Um, had, had our first daughter, and I've had, have since had four children, went back and got a master's degree in education, uh, but then took a job as Moon Warrior Project's first director of alumni. So I got to basically work with all the wounded warriors that were hurt in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and through the service to our country, wherever that might have been. And I've had a lot of experiences in working with these unbelievable men and women in the hospital, out of the hospital, on sea slopes, in the woods, uh, just in, uh, amazing, amazing places. I can tell you one story, and the, and the story is about Team Warren. We brought Kurt Warner, the famous football quarterback, down to Walter Reed. And we brought him down, a lot of times celebrities and famous athletes go down there and they talk to the Wounded Warriors as kind of a morale thing. Say, hey, we appreciate your service, we appreciate your sacrifice. So Kurt Warner works with some guys who are the guys in the civil life. And so he's talking to him, you know, just trying to get an idea of who he is. And before he leaves, he asks him, you know, how do you feel about getting into it? What do you feel about this whole experience? He says, you know what, sir? Uh, I, just, I just wish I was back in Iraq with, with all my brothers and sisters fighting. He said, wow, that's pretty admirable to take. You just lost your leg. Uh, I know that I probably wouldn't want to go back to, to the place where that happened. So he goes into another guy's room, and the guy's now missing two legs. And it inevitably leads to the same question, which again leads to the same answer. And you know what, sir? I, I just, I, I'd rather be back there with my brothers and sisters in, in Iraq and doing the things that they're, they're doing. Because you form an incredible model. And he goes into another person's room. And this person is missing three limbs and is burnt severely throughout his whole body. Ask him the same question, he gets the same answer. Now that's a body. And obviously in the military it's something different. There's life and death there. But it kind of relates back to one thing, that's duty. And duty is what you do, it's your job, it's, it's what you do. And it also has to do with being part of a team. What's, what's your duty on your team? What, is, what does that bond mean to you? Uh, I think that's the ultimate example of, of what a bond is. Because as teams, we share these experiences. Uh, our wins, our losses, our tough practices, our easy practices. And it's kind of your job to, to, to keep on each other. Make each other as good as you possibly can be. And that's one of the best stories that I can relay uh, as far as teamwork goes. Now, being involved in the Wounded Warrior Project about the organization, the, the organization, its, it's mission is to honor and, and empower this, this generation of wounded warriors. And that's what we try to do in every program, every service that we create. <coughs> I've seen blind men ski down mountains. I've seen guys with no legs ski down mountains, men and women. Um, we actually had one guy who was from Pennsylvania, and he was really into hunting growing up. And he lost his eyesight, but he really wanted to do this. So he had the law in Pennsylvania changed so that he could hunt with a laser. And he had his dad as a slaughter, and he went hunting with his dad. He was completely blind. A few years ago, he actually speared a boar. He said, you're completely blind. How do you spear a boar? I didn't understand it. But the indomitable spirit of these men and women is just incredible. And it's been my complete honor in, in, in having the opportunity to, to work with them. And in many ways, me getting injured and this happening to me has made me a better person and a stronger person for having seen this will, uh, this indomitable spirit that our men and women have. I'll never forget the feeling. And 
and this is something that I can very easily relate to you guys, and a message that I really want um, you know, to, to bring out in, in my speech is that you guys and everyone, really, we don't know how lucky we have. And I realized that the day that I crossed the border going into Iraq. For the most part, everyone in this room, we could go about our daily lives without ever realizing that there's a war going on. Because there aren't bombs going off in our, back, in our backyard. We don't have to roll down the street and wonder if that garbage can over there has a bomb in it. Um, we're not worried about the guy who lives down the block kicking in our door at 2 o'clock in the morning and saying, you're going to believe in this or we're going to kill you and your, fa and, your, and your family and your extended family. We're pretty lucky. We're pretty lucky. And we, uh, and we kind of take that for granted sometimes. We take it for granted because we have men and women that are overseas fighting, fighting for us. So it's, it's kind of always, it's always important to remember that these things are going, going on. And that we need to care about the service and sacrifice that these men and women uh, have made for our country and will continue to make. Obviously, the ultimate sacrifices that, that they made if they, if they die on the battlefield and the sacrifices when they get injured. Because uh, that kind of stays with you, with you for a lifetime. It's really, really, like I said, kind of been my honor. I took, took part in a pro one of our programs called Soldier Eye. From uh, and soldier rides go on all throughout the country. They go out of Florida, Texas, California. Uh, but one of the biggest ones it actually started from Montauk to New York and then down to D.C. So we brought in a bunch of Israeli soldiers from the Israeli Defense Force um, and some people from Israel who had also lost their own lives to take part in the soldier ride. And then we had one guy who was probably in Wall Street for six months that was kind of helping this guy out. By the way, Soldier Ride started as a cross-country bike ride. Originally, a guy, a bartender in, in, a, in a bar in Montauk said, we want to raise money for the Blue Warrior Project. Let's ride bikes across the country and raise money wherever we stop along the way. And then the next time they did it was from LA back to Montauk, and they had Wounded Warriors participating in it. And one of the Wounded Warriors had lost his legs up here and had hand -bombed across the whole country. Pretty, pretty incre incredible thing. <laughs> In any case, that's how the program started. So, so while we were going from New York out to Montauk, the Israeli soldier was kind of having a hard time. And throughout the whole course, one of, one of our guys, <coughs> Mr. Reed, who had also lost one of his legs, was kind of helping him out. And he was talking to the guy and saying, listen, six months ago, I was in this position. And, and now I... I can do this, now I can do this, now I got my prosthetic legs, I'm learning how to walk, this, that, and the other thing. And if, and if you look at the logo that's on your shirts, there's one guy carrying another guy. And the one warrior starts out as the guy on top. And he starts out as the guy that's being carried off the battlefield for his injuries. And it's kind of our goal, and part of our mission to honor and empower through all the programs, Turn that guy from the guy on the top to the guy on the bottom, carrying another guy, and bringing him back into society in, in the way that I just explained through, and it doesn't matter where they're from, obviously. It was an Israeli soldier. It wasn't even an American soldier. So I've, I've had the experience to see some incredible things. So one of the things to remember is that we're all lucky for the things that we have. We're lucky for where we grow up. Let's take advantage of it. If you're going to be a part of a team, be a part of a team. You always have a choice in your life. Okay? You always have a choice. Are you going to be, you know, the guy or the girl who <coughs> gives up in the face of adversity? Our coach isn't starting me. I'm going, to, I'm, going to blame, I'm going to blame him. He doesn't know what he's talking about because I'm a better player than, than Sam. And I should be out there. Well, you can complain about it, or you can just really work hard, and the coach will eventually see it. And even if, and even if the coach doesn't, you're going to be a better person for it in the long run, because everyone appreciates a hard worker. Uh, so it's kind of an, 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 important, an important message that kind of carries, carries throughout your life, that you always have a, 
have a choice. It just means to be pushing yourself in, in every situation that, that you're in. I, I talk to you know, a, lo a lot of different groups of people, professional teams, across the college team. And those are kind of the important messages to carry to carry with you. You know, I've kind of experienced it just from looking back and saying, you know what? I didn't give up in this situation. I didn't give up in that situation. It felt like I was ever the most talented guy on the field. I finally got my opportunity. So, so it's just an, an important aspect that you should carry within you know, to always kind of keep pushing, to keep pushing. I can't thank you enough for having me here today. And one of the important things is I spoke about the men and women that are getting hurt. Okay, the <laughs> fact that. We in this room could go about our lives without realizing that there's a war going on. But you've obviously all recognized that there is. Otherwise, you, will, you wouldn't be here. So it's important to kind of keep that with you. Because one of the models that we use kind of at the Wooden Warrior Project is that the greatest casualty is being forgotten. And we've learned that in some of the different wars that we and it's everyone in this room that ensures that that doesn't happen. It really is. And I appreciate you having me here to talk about it. I appreciate you supporting the Wounded Warrior Project. It's a fantastic organization that continues to grow because there are more and more men and women getting hurt. And guess what? If the war ended tomorrow, as Iraq just did, they, these men and women still have to deal with their injuries for the rest of their life. So we're going to be around for a while. There's still another war going on, and just as many or more people getting hurt and dying. So this is something that's still going on. So I appreciate everyone in this room. I appreciate everyone being here. So thank you for that. Share that 